Vsauce, Kevin here with a serial killer who may very well have murdered hundreds. Her systematic killing spree went undetected for years because suspicion just wasn't enough. What finally brought her to justice was mad. Don't leave me here, they're gonna kill me. They kill people here. You know I did it, I did it. You wanted to know, I killed those guys. In the United States, the most dangerous place you can go is the hospital. Yes, doctors and nurses save lives literally every single day, but medical error is a significant cause of death. No matter how hard we try, tragedies happen. And by definition, everyone in a hospital is already sick with something. But murder isn't an accident and a nurse in Massachusetts was straight up killing patients to impress a guy. Kristen Gilbert was a nurse at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Northampton, Massachusetts. She was popular with coworkers. She'd go out clubbing with them in Boston to blow off steam and even through baby showers. She also seemed to be really good at her job. It felt like she was always around to save the day in an emergency. She appeared to be the perfect nurse. But Gilbert was around so often when patients died that other nurses jokingly referred to her as the angel of death. <laughs> it seemed like the Northampton Hospital had a lot of unexpected deaths, but a VA investigation found that the hospital's rate of deaths was in line with similar VA hospitals. So case closed, right? Wrong! Doctors and nurses weren't convinced, but there were no witnesses who saw Gilbert actually do anything suspicious to patients. There wasn't any evidence, but there was data. Here's a question. How often did patients die when Gilbert was on the floor compared to when she wasn't? Was there a correlation between her presence and patient deaths? And if so, was it just an unlucky coincidence? Or was she killing people? The first analysis can be expressed visually. This graph shows patient deaths in the hospital ward between 1988 and 1997, broken down into three shifts, day, evening, and overnight. The 4 p.m. to midnight evening shift stands out as having the most deaths, and Kristen Gilbert worked the evening shift. But that doesn't hold for every year. 1988 and 89 don't match up with the six years that follow it. There weren't that many deaths and they were pretty evenly distributed throughout the day. Kristen Gilbert didn't start working on the ward until 1990. Okay, okay, what about the really high number of deaths during overnight shifts in 1990? That's an outlier in this whole data set. Gilbert worked evenings, but when she started in 1990, she worked the overnight shift. Huh. Huh. <clears throat> yeah. But this graph is still not proof. Variation in human outcomes is tremendous, whether it's education or physical fitness or death. It's totally possible that Kristen Gilbert was present during a statistical blip. It's possible there's some nurse out there working on a floor where patients never seem to die, like some kind of angel of life. Just ask Brandon Mayfield whether coincidences happen, or the FBI. Dr. Stephen Gelbach, who is now Dean Emeritus of UMass Amherst School of Public Health, ran the numbers. He looked at 1,641 nursing shifts over the period of 18 months leading up to staff taking their concerns to hospital management. There were 74 deaths during those shifts, which is a death on 4.51% of all shifts, or 0.045 deaths per shift. Kristen Gilbert worked 257 shifts during that 18-month period. With 0.045 deaths per shift, we'd expect her to be present for about 11 or 12 deaths, about one every six weeks on average. 15 or 16 deaths when you expect 11 or 12 could be an unlucky statistical anomaly. She was there for 40, 40. 
A patient died on over 15% of Gilbert's shifts. What are the chances of that? Literally one in 100 million and maybe even less. In the handwriting analysis I did of Sylvia Howland's will, Hetty Green's forgery matched on way too many points to chalk it up to a crazy coincidence. One in sextillions. Gelbach calculated p-values to estimate the chance of Gilbert's nursing death rate at less than 1 in 100 million. But we know from the Sally Clark trial that a probability like 1 in 73 million isn't necessarily what it feels like it is. Correlation isn't causation. Maybe her patients were just sicker than normal. This time, that uncertainty was okay. It was enough for the grand jury to proceed. A grand jury doesn't have to determine guilt or innocence the way a trial does. They just decide whether the evidence is compelling enough to proceed with criminal charges. They did. Again, there wasn't proof. But the math gave enough context to the suspicions of the Veterans Administration, hospital management, and Gilbert's co-workers to proceed with charges. But how was she killing these people? And why? Prosecutors allege that Gilbert had injected patients with epinephrine, which you probably know as adrenaline, which sped up their hearts and caused cardiac failure. Adrenaline is untraceable, but the hospital found that it had a lot of epinephrine go missing during Gilbert's employment. And some of the patients, like Henry Hewden, who was relatively young and a paranoid schizophrenia patient, weren't likely to have three heart attacks in one night without something artificially causing it. But why would a professional mother of two in suburbia become a deranged supervillain? Well... She seemed to have delusions of grandeur in which she herself put patients in critical condition and then heroically tried to resuscitate them. She had a history of manipulative behavior, mental illness, and abuse of patients. As a home care aide in the 1980s, she scalded a mentally disabled child with hot bath water on purpose. Kristen Gilbert may have been unhinged, but she was also in love. Obsessively in love. Every time a patient coded, hospital policy mandated that a police officer engage in CPR. In late 1995 and early 96, the same police officer responded to every single cardiac arrest that Gilbert reported. James Peral, Kristen's boyfriend the man she left her husband and two children for. Witnesses noticed her touching Peralt affectionately during resuscitation efforts and wiping his sweaty brow. Court papers show that one witness will testify that he observed Gilbert playing footsie with Peralt during the middle of a code. Gross. Peralt ended the relationship and Gilbert was angry. On a phone call from a psychiatric facility, she confessed to him by saying, You know, I did it. I did it. You wanted to know. I killed those guys. Peralt immediately went to the authorities, so she called in a bomb threat to the VA hospital where they worked. Decades of troubling behavior culminated in a systemic killing spree that allowed Gilbert to be the focal point of crisis after crisis. Staff testified about her access to the adrenaline that induced cardiac events, and doctors testified that the unexpected excess deaths were often relatively healthy, middle-aged men. The same pattern just kept happening. Kristen Gilbert was convicted of four murders and two attempted murders, and the bomb threat to a federal facility. It's possible and probable that she was involved in many, many more patient deaths that weren't the accidents they seemed to be, but prosecutors couldn't prove it. She could have faced the death penalty, but a compassionate judge and jury sentenced her to a life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 20 years. 
The mathematical analysis that was so critical to Gilbert's downfall wasn't even used in the trial. The trial judge ruled that the statistical evidence was prejudicial, as it likely wouldn't be understood by the jury as not being ironclad numerical proof of her guilt. I've shown that math can be an incredible asset in court, or that it can turn innocent people into criminals. We're getting used to scientific and mathematical evidence like DNA and forensics determining guilt or innocence, but the reality is math and science don't have to do all the work. Dozens and maybe hundreds of veterans are alive in Massachusetts because of a bar graph. Math and science don't always have to put out the fire. Sometimes all they should do all they need to do is sound the alarm. And as always, thanks for watching.